welcome to Show Don't Tell, a podcast by Tell Screen's team of Wes Harris and Kent Harris, sharing their stories of being in the eye care industry in their unique, punny style with facilitator Christy. Welcome to another exciting episode of Show Don't Tell with Kent and Wes Harris, facilitated by Christy. Hi. <laughs> the part of Christy will be played by Kent today. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. <laughs> the guys have just ate, eaten, ate eaten. lunch, eaten lunch, eaten lunch, and we want to be very succinct with our topic today, and it's also relevant to have eaten, just ate lunch, because we're going to talk about the top eight, eight questions <laughs> our customers have. That's right. The first one is not what was for lunch. <laughs> and if you've been around at all and you've listened to some of these episodes, you'll... you'll God bless you. <laughs> for one. <laughs> and you'll also notice that these guys are very punny in their style, which is makes it a little lighthearted and fun to talk about some, you know, serious questions and getting into the minutia of what technology is and does for you and your practice. So take it away, Wes. Top eight questions on the board. So... We kind of have a subdivision here, and Kent handles the technical, and mm -hmm. I usually handle more of the, the sales and the business side. So we're going to start with the technical first. Does it work with my EHR? Almost all electronic health record systems, that's what EHR was for those who are not in the lingo, <laughs> have some way to import a photo or a report or a PDF, basically a known file format is the mechanism they use. And we can certainly export a compatible file format. So will it work with my EHR? Almost 99% yes. Um, however, almost none, none of the EHRs, or almost none, there may be one out there, allow you to import video. So if you need video uh, in your medical record, we usually recommend our viewing software, which allows you to view video anywhere else in your exam lane. And um, so that's... That's, that's the short answer of electronic health records. Now, the exciting news is that um, more of the electronic health records are um, adopting a DICOM standard, which was an, a standard that was originally developed for x-rays back in the, I think, 70s or 60s, somewhere in the, around there. It was pretty early. Yeah, it was early. I did research on it back in grad school, so... Anyway, well, that's, that's been 80s. a bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, but that imaging standard has evolved to support a lot of different, as they call it, modalities. Mm -hmm. So, the methods of well, first transmitting you needed data. a communications network for DICOM, and DARPANET 60s would have been the very, very <clears throat> earliest. So, yeah, the, I read a paper that I think was in the 70s on on DICOM. So, anyway, it's been around for a while. Whether you know from the don't know when the first implementation was, but certainly the idea for it has been, was been around has been around for a while. It used to be called PAX for a picture archiving communication system, I think. Anyway, nice little trivia, technical trivia for today for 100, Alex. <laughs> what nice. was the name of the X-ray imaging standard back in the 70s? PAX. <laughs> now, PAX is a generic term. Yeah. And DICOM is one implementation, implementation. of it. Thank you. Well, there we go. <laughs> Side note. <laughs> And I'm sure there's going to be a lot. So whoever's taking notes, there's a lot going on here today. So bottom line is how easy it is to use your EHR with the IRS system depends upon how much the EHR has devoted to integration with other products. So we built our system to have a number of different interfaces available from the, uh, the manual process of export from here, import there, where it's more tech-driven, Dr. Marks, I want this photo in the chart, and then the technician exports it from IRES, imports it to the EHR. And then several packages built some semi-automatic mechanisms that would watch a folder, so we could export to a folder, and they would watch it, parse the file name, and bring it into the patient's record semi-automatically. Um, and uh, DICOM takes it one step further and makes it uh, more automated end-to-end. -end. Okay. Things that a patient really doesn't even have to think about. Like all that stuff's just yep. part of what a doctor <clears throat> and the staff have to do as part of the practice. And that sounds very complicated as a patient. <laughs> well, it, if you were a patient back in the 70s and you had an x-ray done, you might remember if you were sent, had an x-ray at your primary care office and then had to go see a specialist, 
you might remember having to take film, like picking up a big envelope of film, of x-ray film, developed x-ray film, and then bring it with you to your appointment. So the communication method was your doctor handed you this envelope of your x-rays and you took it to your next visit. <laughs> and you all know the probability that that x-ray <laughs> made it to that visit. I was, I was just thinking I'm user error. <laughs> right? yeah, so. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so that was question number one. So the uh, corresponding question I get in the exam lane is, will it fit on my existing slit lamp? Uh, basically, do I have to buy a new slit lamp to use your camera? And there are some of our competitors who basically built imaging systems as a way to sell slit lamps. If you want an imaging system, it only works on our newest slit lamp, and this is it, and here's your whole package. And we thought that was a little bit unfair, that if you like your slit lamp and it still works, you shouldn't have to get rid of it just to get a camera put on it. So That was our green initiative, reuse. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> And I'm wearing my green shirt today, just for that reason. <laughs> and I'm relatively new to podcasts, so there's our third green. <laughs> <laughs> so we designed the IRIS system. <laughs> Keep moving this forward. <laughs> Keep moving forward. Ed- editor's note, cut that last little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we designed the IRIS system to f- fit most existing slit lamps. Basically, we have to find the right optical adapter. Uh, you need to have a Galilean-style slit lamp a knob on the side to change mags, not a lever between the eyepieces that's flipping between 10X and 16X, for instance. So if you have a Galilean slit lamp, then uh, either uh, a discrete three mag or five mag slit lamp or some zoom slit lamps, then chances are very, very good that we could put a, a modern camera on it without making you buy a new slit lamp. That's question number two. It is question number two. For those keeping score at home. <laughs> Question number three that I get, uh, usually uh, sometime during either the installation or slightly thereafter, someone will finally alert uh, their information technology professionals in their practice that, hey, I'm adding new equipment to my practice. (laughs) And the IT people say, oh, well, where where are you keeping the data? Where are the images stored? And so, uh, you know, my short answer to that question is, where do you want to store them? an advantage of having engineers support our product is that routine customizations are built in. They were, they were anticipated in the product design. And where you store the data is one of those routine customizations. We can store it locally. Uh, a quick, we can have a turnkey instrument that everything's on the instrument, and it's right there and available, and many, many other products do that. Uh, we can move your data to your own server, and if you have automated backup or automated cloud backup or, or uh, you know, the, the various uh, encrypted storage options that are available, we can do that for you. Um, it's, all, it's all possible. So we'll work with you and your IT provider to deliver the best solution for your situation. So rather than telling you where your images are stored, we'll ask you where do you want that to be, and we'll make it work that way. And if you don't know or you don't care, then we have default options that have been proven to work very well. That's okay. As somebody who is, I will say it, I'm a control freak. I need, I need to be in control of where that's happening. Like, I don't want to adjust to that. It needs to adjust to me. I'm that person. Do you guys have other people like that out there anywhere? <laughs> yeah, yes, we do. Yeah. <laughs> so to be able to have that custom approach to where my data goes, that's a big deal. And back at... Uh, the historical note on why we built those customizations back in the very first versions of the software when I was writing it, hard drives were, I think, what, we were 100 meg, 200, five, 200 meg, I think, about 200 meg hard drives. Yeah. So a hard drive was only 200, meg, 200 megabytes, somewhere around there, maybe 500. Like but 200 meg. Megabytes, like not, even a, not even a gigabyte yet. <laughs> we, we, we weren't on to gigabyte storage uh, just yet. And so a real issue was, okay, doing the engineering analysis, how many photos are they going to take? How many patients are they going to have? How much will fit on a hard drive? When will I, how will I manage storage? How many can I burn on a CD? Yes, (laughs) Uh, that was a a valid question, right? A CD was 700. 650, 650. 650. After formatting. Right. And uh, so you, you had to consider those things. And the other question was we wanted to make sure that, a doctor could 
put imaging in more than one place in his practice, and then it wouldn't matter where the patient was chaired, he would have access to his images. So we built in networking from the very beginning. That was a, de a design feature. And back in those days, we even had to split storage among all your units to use all the available hard drive space to try and get maximum storage. And we pretty much expected that the, the rate of technological advancement would keep far ahead of the rate of data gathering of, of our eye doctors because they're the number of patients a doctor can physically see in a year, that's kind of capped. I mean, there haven't been any revolutionary, I don't think, improvements. I mean, maybe, you know, the growth rate of it certainly is, is not exponential. It might be a slight linear factor. People might get a little more efficient with the HR software or with other packages that let them see an extra patient or two uh, in, in an hour. But um, so... Kalen worked for a retinal specialist who saw a hundred and some patients in the morning on Friday when it was injection clinic. And that's probably a hard limit on how many patients can, and that was actually a two doctor morning, uh, but how many patients can a doctor physically see in a certain amount of time? Yeah, you know, 50 and a half day is moving awful fast. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're talking what, they said two doctors, so you're looking at... No, well, 50 per doctor. 50 per doctor, but you're right. talking 12, about 12, you know, 12 an hour. An hour right. right. Yeah. I mean, you certainly yeah. wouldn't be doing imaging or a full exam workup on that. I mean, our, our eye doctors are anywhere. I, I mean, we had one eye doctor that was, he, he specifically left an hour for each patient so that he could do a super thorough exam for all of his comprehensive exam patients. And he just liked it that way because he, he you know, he said, look, I want to make sure that everyone gets the most comprehensive care when they first come in. And then, you know, follow-ups are routinely 15 minutes, you know, a 15-minute to 30-minute appointment. But I would say most of our docs are, what, four an hour maybe? Uh, yeah, four, a, yeah, three to four an hour is a pretty good number. Where you've got a mixture of, of complex and simple, uh, you know, in terms of patients you've seen before or not. I mean, I, I would guess. I, I don't know. But you know, still, at four an hour, that's 32 a day for an eight-hour day. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty heavy load. Most, most people would agree. That's a, that's a pretty heavy load for a doctor. Um, so, yeah, so that kind of puts a cap. So even if they get technology that helps them go a little faster, maybe they're getting 40 a day instead of 32, but they're not getting like 60 or 90. I mean, they're not growing that rate. Whereas, and most of them don't want to. And most of them don't want to. Yeah, I don't blame them. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. Uh, but storage-wise, you know, obviously in the in the twenty-something years we've been doing this, now the standard instead of two hundred megabytes, it's one terabyte. So that's that's a, a million megabytes is a terabyte. So I was saying I don't. You're I, looking at it's it's kind of weird just in the storage numbers alone, mm -hmm. like in my lifetime to cast on two hundred and fifty meg. I was like. Wow, wow, I yeah. found one of those little buggers one day. A the floppy little, drive? The little drive. Floppy disk. The it, three and a halfs? Mm-hmm. Yep. I still have 720 those. kilobytes or one Per port, side. Yeah, or <laughs> 1.44 megabytes. Woo! We were so excited when a floppy drive got to a megabyte. That was a big deal. Well, and and total tangent here, but like the old cartoons, G.I. Joe, I'd been watching that a little bit recently and of course you go in and you have to s mm -hmm. steal the thing out of, <laughs> right. and it was the the big what eight inch yeah big mm -hmm. platters the big platters and they were right. taking it out of it. it was like oh wow how far yeah. we have come the wang word processor with the eight inch Ooh, floppy drive <laughs> that was crazy okay <laughs> so back to the questions so that kind of circles around into the conversation about will it pay for itself yeah and uh, when you talk about storage and having enough storage for all the data, uh, will it pay for itself comes down to how often are you using it, who are your patients, what do they need, and if you have a patient demographic that's all young, healthy kids with no problems whatsoever, and it's just, can you read the eye chart, yes or no, uh, you might not need an imaging system for that case. Sprinkle in a few adults, a few contact lens abusers, anyone who's old enough to have an age-related eye disease, um, anybody who works with metal in a machine shop, on an assembly line, uh, foreign body removal is a, a big thing. Oh, okay, yep. Um, so once you start to sprinkle in any of those things, uh, people that have allergies, people that have red eyes, uh, anything that ends in itis. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
then there's a whole bunch of reasons why you might want to take a picture. And so the will it pay for itself conversation really starts with what's your demographic? Who are the people that you see on a daily basis? Uh, tell me about your last uh, five cases. And if your last five cases are all, you know, well, wellness, uh, eye health checks, uh, prescription updates, um, and you had no sniff of anything medical in your last five, um, that would be a, a question for me of do you really need this technology or not? And it's not for everybody. It's not for every practice modality. Uh, if you are treating medical, then there's probably a place for it. And the next question becomes, well, how much medical are you seeing? How often does it occur? Uh, we have a pretty good idea on the reimbursement side from Medicare, uh, state by state. Uh, the, those numbers are updated every year and usually published around March or so, or in their final form. Um, so we can actually do a, a, a custom business case uh, based upon your practice, your patients, what you usually see, how much does it pay in your area, what are your major insurance carriers that you accept. Uh, we can figure it out. What should your cash flow be? What should the rate of return on this equipment be? What's the payback period? Is it going to take two years to pay for itself? Is it going to take four years? Is it going to be six months? Uh, I think the fastest was uh, six weeks. Wow. For practice in Florida in which everybody had sun exposure. Right. <laughs> everybody had something. And, uh, you know, treating the medical conditions associated with the weather was a big part of the practice. I was going to say, because it sounds like, to me, that kind of a question, the first answer is, it depends. Mm -hmm. But you guys also have a formula to figure out how to get to the answer that they're looking for. Right. Yeah, and the thing I always want to bring up is the one thing that isn't accounted for, will it pay for itself? You also have to account for, how does this make my practice and my time more efficient when I'm communicating with a patient? Does it save me any time? Does it give me an extra breather? Does it... Does it save a minute or two per patient uh, in the discussions for those patients? Because those are the sort of soft benefits that we don't have really good ways of measuring, at least measuring to an engineer's satisfaction. Well, quality of life for a practitioner. So in the early days when we were developing this product, we were working with Dr. Larry Alexander when he was practicing here in Louisville. And the first prototype he looked at and he said, images are great, but I can't use this. This sucks. No, and no, his exact words, this is crap. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> the reason why, it would take too long to use. And so that led us to focus on user interface and improving the product so that he was faster practicing with an imaging system than he was without one. And that's when he said, now you've got something. So the idea that the imaging system can at least not, very least not slow you down, but possibly speed you up just a little bit because the patient understands faster they feel like they got access to your expertise and it was a quick process you didn't keep them in exam lane jail for 30 minutes uh, so you didn't bring out the the models that nobody that anybody who is who has not studied anatomy can't figure out you know when they're looking at a 3d model of an eye and they're trying to imagine you know, I don't, I don't know if other people are bad at this or not, but sometimes getting oriented in a 3D space with a little physical model is sometimes hard <laughs> to figure out what, what am I looking at? What, what are you showing right. me here? Yeah, and all these plastic pieces. Where yeah. yeah, I'm not familiar so, with any of that. <laughs> so being able to use a photo of the patient's own eye rather than a model of some sort. Right. Or a cartoon or a sketch or like um, – Back in the day when my daughter needed to see a cardiologist on a regular basis, um, you know the uh, paper that would line the bed, the yeah. exam bed? So he would be sketching on that paper <laughs> and drawing Try, QRS drawing complexes it. and you know EKG traces across the – that was his, uh, his educational media at the time. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, you uh, do what you got to do. <laughs> yeah. uh, amazing cardiologist, but he could have used a picture or two. Right. <laughs> So, no. <laughs> so as a presentation tool, you know, there's other values to the equipment other than just the dollar, the income value. As, as my father said long ago when he was trying to boil this down simply, he said, there's, there's two ways you can improve the financials of your business. You can increase revenue or you can decrease costs. And any technology should be evaluated which, which bucket does it fit into. And if it doesn't fit into any of those buckets, then maybe you shouldn't purchase it because it might just be a, a shiny new thing 
that doesn't decrease your expenses and doesn't increase revenue, but it looked shiny and new and sounded great when you were on the show floor <laughs> with a charismatic person that was presenting this shiny new thing to you. Sales people that look better than us. Yeah. And I would say the same goes for your marketing plans. Just <laughs> FYI. <laughs> Don't buy into the shiny object syndrome. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, so is that is that an SOS plan, the shiny object syndrome? And that's that is one <laughs> of the things that in my own business I help my clients overcome. Like, no, you. I'm like, focus, focus here, <laughs> right here. <laughs> Kent and I are both looking at her snapping fingers. <laughs> <no choice>. Yes, <laughs> we've been trained. <laughs> Ooh, ooh, what's shiny? I see shiny. Shiny. Like, what about focus. this? What about that? And I'm like, no, you've got this right here. We'll stay in this lane. Um, okay, so um, faster for the practitioner, mm -hmm. better experience for the patient. Hey, that sounds nice and succinct. Right? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's where we've that, got that, to so far. Can we put that on our tagline? I don't know. <laughs> then the third faster value for the it. doctor, better for the patient. <laughs> yeah. Can we just add that? Just send that out in the next. Uh... <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Wes, you were saying? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, the third issue is, yes. does it produce marketing value? Oh, yeah. yeah. Does it help you, uh, help the patient to understand that they need other services? Even if they don't necessarily want to need them, they actually would benefit, their health would benefit, their eye health would be better if they availed themselves of some other things that the practice does, such as meibomian gland expression and, uh, you know, dry eye treatment of various sorts, either products or supplements or procedures, or procedures yeah. uh, that uh, generate revenue for the practice. And this can be a tool, imaging can be a tool to help patients realize that they need it. Uh, so when, for example, decrease your marketing expenses for those procedures. Mm -hmm. when, when you do um, blepharo exfoliation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> With one of the various tools out there. Gesundheit. Uh, <laughs> being able to show the patient before and after that this procedure made a difference. Your lid margin is much cleaner and much healthier now. We've got rid of the, the scurf and debris that collects there and uh, have taken away the uh, food source for demodex mites or other things. Um, Understood. That, uh, that story, uh, patients will pay for that. Right. When they know why they're paying for it. Well, and having the, the image right there versus the explaining it, either writing it out on a piece of paper or the 3D model, having that image of my own eyeball, my trust factor in my doctor is like through the roof amazing at that point mm -hmm. because you're allowing me to see exactly what you're talking about. And that, so now I'm like, we're on the same page with it's this. It's almost like you're showing them, not telling, telling them. them. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> Five points to Ken. Because all, right. all his other speech has been pointless up to this point. <laughs> Come on now. I awarded no points. He's correct. I awarded no points until just now. <laughs> we'll do a fast and easy question. Can I put the data on my server? Uh, that f reference that earlier question. Yes. So the answer is yep. yes, because they get to choose where their data goes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if they wanted to go on the server, they can. That's correct. Awesome. All right. Question I get quite often is, why didn't you make me do this sooner? <laughs> and <laughs> I like that question. <laughs> if compulsion were my superpower, I would probably use it on something else, like <laughs> keeping bad people from doing bad things. Sure. I, I probably wouldn't waste that superpower helping good doctors make better decisions about equipment. <laughs> you know, you'll put it off until you're ready for it. And uh, once you have it, then you'll say, oh, wow, this is pretty cool. Why didn't you make me? And I'll say, well, I don't have that superpower. Sorry about that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, your decision, when does your practice need it? Quite often, the uh, cold start practice benefits tremendously as the first piece of technology. Because it's versatile, you can use a frontier segment. You can take a condensing lens, 90 diopter, 78 diopter, uh, digital 1.0 from Volk. Uh, shout out. Uh, and now you've got a fundus camera. You can take a picture of the back of the eye. You have to do a little bit of work on the slit lamp to scan around to see the entire area. But you can use it as a fundus camera for, for posterior conditions as well. So it can become the one tool, the one imaging tool that you need first. It's not the only one you need. It's not the only one you'll ever need. But it's a first tool. So 
for startup practice, it's a money-saving idea. If you can't buy that OCT with the dual OCT fundus camera built in. And the Kung Fu grip. (laughs) G.I. Joe (laughs) throwback (laughs) reference. So if if you can't get that out of the right out of the box, then a good anterior segment camera can do both until you have the patient flow that you need to be faster and then the fundus camera now saves you time, which reduces your cost. Awesome. Was that the last question? Oh, no. uh, I've got a question. Number seven was, can I use my existing computer in my exam lane? And this actually happened recently. I was um, at the West Virginia uh, OA meeting at the Greenbrier, such a lovely property, it's amazing. Um, and uh, one of the doctors had asked, well, I just bought brand new computers for my lanes. I just, you know, I just opened the practice a few months ago. I just bought new computers, can I use them? And yeah, it's, it, it may or may not be technically possible on any given computer. Depending upon which imaging system Depending on buying. which imaging system you buy, they may or may not have the interfaces we need. Um, the computer is one of those engineered components that we design into our system so you don't have to make those detailed decisions. So it can certainly, you know, yes, it, it is a computer in there. You'll, you'll see a, a, a label from a recognized computer brand like Dell or HP <laughs> in our product, but uh, it, may, it may cost, it may not be cheaper to use your computer if we've got to do a lot of extra work to make it work. And if we have to research and and look at, oh, okay, well, gosh, your computer only had this much RAM or or we needed this slot and you don't have it and you didn't put the option to have the nine pin serial port on the back to have a foot pedal attachment. So now we gotta have another way to get a foot pedal. And nine pin what? (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, those, there are details that go into these things and yeah, you just bought a brand new computer, but that doesn't mean it was designed for imaging. So, you know, if you think that you're going to save a ton of money by using your own machines, that's a, mis- a misperception. It probably won't be that much cheaper because anything that we save on the hardware side, we have to now have custom engineering work to make sure that we have a solution that works and it adds back on the cost side. Gotcha. So, well, and that makes sense. So what would be the best... What would be the best thing for somebody to do whenever they're in that position? Um, a lot of times what I recommended for this doctor is I said, well, our computer is generally stronger than most uh, a typical machine that you will get. It will have extra capability, extra room and processing power in it because we want to I- ensure that if you do use this computer as the only computer in your exam lane, that you can run your other applications on it, most likely. So. I often can recommend said, hey, you can use our computer in the exam lanes because if you can't put exam lanes in every single uh, imaging systems in every single exam lane, then you may have some, you know, in the lanes that you do add imaging, you can use that computer for your general purpose computing needs in those lanes and then have the new ones that you just bought. Well, now you've got a spare in case one of your other machines crashes or dies. You've got hardware ready to go. And, and you really haven't lost it, you've just deferred the, the value of it. So it can be used as a, as a hot spare, pre-configured, ready to just plug in and go. So if you do have a computer problem, your downtime is take this one out, plug it in, go. Gotcha. So it can really cut down the impact of a computer fouls up while you're trying to get something done. So. But if it is a brand new machine and you're using our latest systems, some of that might be possible. Yeah, we might be able to do some custom work and maybe we could save you a little bit of money, but it's gonna be a little bit. It's not gonna be a lot. Yeah, part of what we pride ourselves on is delivering complete solutions that work. And to make sure that they work, it takes some testing, it takes some thought about the component selection. If you're asking us to substitute a component, we're going to not only just think about it, we're also going to test it before we say, yes, this is still a telescreen imaging system. Right. And that happens uh, just in our regular course of business as computer manufacturers deliver new models and innovate and, and new form factors, all those things. Every time we get a build, even if it's the same form factor and it's the same model, and it's, but it's another generation, it's a slightly different model number, but it's the same family, then we still have to go through settings and testing because there's a lot of little details under the hood that if you don't check them, one of them will bite you. 
<laughs> and that's not fun. <laughs> not, no. So that was a nice segue into the last question of the top eight. Okay. I want this in all my exam lanes, but how can I afford that? Oh. And, you know, you're right. It's, uh, it's one of those things that once you get used to having it, you want it everywhere. You don't want a patient to walk into one room and remember, well, last visit you took a picture of my eye. How come we're not doing that this time? And it's kind of doesn't feel good to say, well, we're in the wrong room. Right. Or, <laughs> or you know, we have that in special places, but today you're not special. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, nobody wants to say that. No. We don't like you. <laughs> We used to like you, but now we don't. Yeah, sorry no about your No digital life. imaging for you. <laughs> <laughs> the soup Nazis made an appearance. Uh, so the question is, uh, how do you afford that? And there are practices that have said, okay, I have 15 exam lanes. I need 15 cameras, and they made that happen. Uh, that's not the typical practice. That's not the normal case. That is an exceptional case. Uh, it takes a, a fairly well-established practice to have the cash flow or the line of credit to support that, and, or the, and, and, and the, the experience business. knowing that, the, that imaging will pay for itself. Right. So part of it is it's not their first imaging system. They, they learned early on that if I have it and I use it, it pays for itself. And so therefore, this is not as big a risk as other people might perceive because of their experience base in their own practice, in their own state, with Medicare reimbursement, with other insurance uh, reimbursements. Uh, with uh, uh, out-of-pocket uh, uh, willingness to pay uh, from their uh, cash-paying customers. So that de that basically deleverages the risk for them because they, they already know what the revenue stream is going to be. But for those who are not in that position, the key question is, how many exam lanes do you have that are fully equipped? You invested in a chair and a stand and a four-opter and a slit lamp, uh, maybe hand tools, imaging lenses, uh, you've got cabinets and sinks and did some plumbing to build an exam room here, uh, and you've equipped it. That's not cheap. If you're sending enough patients through that room that you're happy that you built it, then just the lamp imaging will probably pay for itself. If that room is at the end of the hall and it gets used once a month, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> and I would say there's other issues to consider besides just whether or not you're getting a slit lamp or an imaging system. Uh, yes. Yeah, the yeah. question of scale. Do you need an associate so that you can see enough patients that you can book it and use it? Yeah. Or did you overbuild and you've got some growing to do? Uh, a lot of uh, practices on the cold start side will build for a certain number of exam rooms, but they'll only equip two of them at the start or sometimes just one at the start. Basically let the revenue grow and the patient base grow until you need the second one before you invest in the equipment. But you already have the space to grow into. But you've got the space. Yep. You've, you've wired it up. You've put mm. the networking jacks in. So you've done the build out, and you've paid those up the fixed mm -hmm. cost of that up front because yeah. you're already doing it. It's more efficient. So, mm -hmm. yeah, planning but, ahead. Yeah, uh, but part of what we can do is we can do a custom business analysis once we understand your demographics and how busy you are, how many doctors you have, uh, and how your patients flow through your practice. Do you move them from the pretest equipment to another room in, in which techs are doing some workup and then you move them to an exam room or do they get moved from pretest directly to an exam room and the doctor cycles through a bunch of exam rooms and if there are special rooms for exams then those are the rooms that need imaging and if every room is the same then you can make a case where they all need imaging and how do you get there and that again becomes uh, practice specific as to what the best path would be gotcha i think that's all we got well, um, one of the, the key things that I've heard through a lot of this is that you guys really get into the weeds with your clients so that you can develop those custom uh, solutions that are going to work for their practice. Yeah. And actually, I want to give a shout out to uh, Jay Wallach at NIDEC. Uh, one of the uh, common questions we get at laser courses is, why would an optometrist need a green laser? And Jay's answer is, in 99.99% .99 of practices, you would never use a green laser enough to pay for itself. And part of my job is to prevent you from doing that, unless you're in that one one hundredth of one percent that would actually use it often enough that it would be a good decision. And I 
I appreciate that perspective that part of a salesperson's job is to make sure that we don't let our customers buy things they don't need. Right. Well, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who are very appreciative of that. Well, there are a lot of salespeople out there on commission whose job is to make sure their family gets fed. Sure. And <laughs> sure. We're not them. So our job is to make sure that we have long-term relationships with doctors. Who Sean are and Josh, don't listen to that statement. <laughs> you'll, you'll still get fed. <laughs> uh, they can feed themselves. <laughs> <laughs> but again, the goal is the long-term relationship. We want you to be happy that you met us. Right. We, we don't want you to look at it and say, gosh, I wish I hadn't have bought that. No, because you like that one question they keep asking. Yeah. Why didn't you make me get this sooner? Exactly. We want them to keep asking that question. Exactly. And there's plenty of options for that. So. And, you know, one of the fun philo- philosophical things that I've come to discover about business, if you take a short-sighted view of what – how can I sell the most right now without considering the customer's needs or wants? Then you've imposed an additional cost in your business that has been hidden to you and you may be unaware of. Because if that customer discovers that they didn't need it and you sold it to them, the chance of them coming back to you for a solution or for help just went to zero. You just lost a customer and you didn't even know it. Pretty much. So that could be a huge cost. And... So don't do that. Minimize your cost. <laughs> so don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, these have been great questions, you guys. I I appreciate the extra information for some of these to go a little little deeper into the uh, especially the technical Was, stuff. I always learn something new with technical things. So we have a special segment today. Shocking statistics. statistics. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the enthusiasm for statistics. How unexpected. (laughs) In a well-known Dilbert cartoon, a clerical worker tells the pointy-haired boss, this is shocking. Fully 40% of your staff's sick days are taken on Mondays and Fridays. And the boss replies, what kind of idiot do they think I am? And the assistant says, not an idiot savant. They can do math. (laughs) Can't you want to explain it to people? (laughs) Well, you see, there are five work days. No. (laughs) (laughs) Is that all you got? (laughs) No. (laughs) In a similar vein, a doctor once told me with tongue firmly planted in cheek, 100% of after-hours medical emergencies occur when my office is closed. (laughs) How inconvenient. (laughs) Somebody should do something about that. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> uh, my recommendation is perhaps we should teach st- statistics to more people. And I, I thought my solution was maybe we should just administer more electroshock treatments to more people. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Shocking <Being> statistics. statistics. <laughs> oh, and we're done. <laughs> <laughs> this concludes another fine episode of Show Don't Tell. He said it was fine. <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody, for listening, for continuing to come back and support the podcast and the fellows. Say hi when you see them out at the next trade show because... AOA, Washington, D.C., June 22nd. And then this fall, isn't that September? Vision Expo West. Vision Expo West this fall. So catch you again on the next episode of... Show, Show. Don't Don't Tell. Tell.